Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, Ivana, and today I have Dr. Jeff Tompkins, ICR's Director of Research and Geneticist. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great. Well, we're glad to have you. And I wanted to talk to you about an interesting concept. Some people may know the idea, but maybe not the term that we're going to use um, to describe this. But we both know that the theory of evolution, it has some holes. And um, as we talk about different things, I think one of the biggest issues that might be from at least the biological perspective, uh, one of the biggest issues to explain would be the concept that life is coming from non-life. And I've heard that called abiogenesis. And I believe you're very well versed in explaining this topic for our viewers and listeners, but could you explain that if, if I'm defining that correctly, is that the right way you would explain that? Yeah, that's a great way to explain it, really. Life from non-life. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, life just magically popped into existence. The first so-called ancestral cell that led to the evolution of everything we see today, plants, animals, it just popped into existence from non-life. So that's a great mm -hmm. way to, to phrase it. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. That way we're all on the same page, especially if we're not familiar with that. Um, but from my understanding of evolution, so we're explaining this first spark of life. And I know I've been taught or heard some of these ideas of the primordial soup or lake where things got started, all the right components maybe bumped into each other. Maybe that's not quite the right way to phrase that, but could you give us the explanation, go a little bit further, abiogenesis, life from non-life, how is this explanation trying to answer that question of where did life come from or start? Right. Well, this is probably one of the, if not the biggest problem for evolution. Mm -hmm. How did life get going to begin with? And I've studied books and in journal papers on this, and there absolutely is no consensus because it's such a difficult mm. issue. So some scientists would say, yes, it, it happened in a warm little pond. Other ones would say, no, it happened near a thermal vent. And and there's just so many problems with this this issue to begin with, which we'll, we'll get into as we get going. Yeah, okay. So thank you for putting it that way. I think a lot of us assume that if someone is saying a certain term or they're giving a short explanation, then there's got to be enough information behind that. We can trust that and move forward. Um, and I think that's pretty common when it comes to evolution. But is this, this explanation or different explanations within abiogenesis, is that something that came after evolution started? We, we need that explanation or did it all just form at the same time as far as um, this idea of abiogenesis the, the lake or the vent that you mentioned, were those instantly proposed when evolution came about as a theory? Well, actually, uh, evolution came about as a, as a somewhat mature theory or what we would say, say is Darwinian evolution in the mid-1800s okay. with Charles Darwin and some of his associates at that period in time. And as their ideas gained popularity, people began really saying, okay, but how did life get going to begin with? Because mm -hmm. that tells us nothing about that. Now, evolution itself really has no solid evidence to support it. But what about the, the problem of how life got going? And so scientists in the early 1900s began to say, hey, we need to, to find a, a solution to this huge problem. Mm -hmm. And so that, that led to a lot of speculation on the whole idea. And eventually in the 1950s, there were some experiments that were done to, to attempt to get to the bottom of that very thorny and problematic issue. Mm -hmm. And as I'll talk about here in a little bit, those experiments really <laughs> caused more problems than, than they solved. Okay, Let, let's go ahead and talk about that. Um, you mentioned, I, I have here that it was an experiment in 1953, maybe there were others as well, and what it was trying to do from naturalistic processes result in these basic molecules of life. And could you tell us maybe what are some of the things that they tried in these early experiments, and then what, what did they learn or maybe not learn from those? 
Well, in the 1950s, scientists were still trying to figure out what was the relationship between DNA uh, and proteins and RNA and really how the whole system worked in, in creatures. So they thought that proteins were really the key thing that, that could have developed spontaneously in the beginning. So that's what they, they focused on. Well, first of all, let's see what proteins are. So proteins are these chains of amino acids. There's 20 amino acids, different, different amino acids that are used in, in living creatures to, to create proteins. They have to be polymerized or joined together in a very complex process that involves complex cellular machinery. Multiple proteins are involved in, in this machinery. It's very specific and very complex. But scientists tried to figure out in the 1950s, well, if amino acids are the building blocks of protein and life, mm -hmm. can we create these spontaneously in some way? And so they devised some experiments where they had this contraption. It was this big glass uh, apparatus where they boiled a mixture of ammonia and some other very basic compounds okay. And they boiled it, and the steam would go through this contraption, and then they would condense uh, the material after they shocked it with this massive uh, shock coming from an electrode as the steam was moving through the system. And then they would trap the, the materials that were created from this electrode and this shocking of this, this gaseous ammonia mixture. Because if they didn't trap this material, it would just cycle back through the whole system and destroy it as fast as it okay. made it. So mm -hmm. they were able to create some of the most basic amino acids that we see. Now, amino acids are very complex. They have complex side chains that give them uh, specific functions that, that indicate whether they're water-loving or, or water-repelling, hydrophobic, hydrophilic. Uh, whether they have a positive charge, a negative charge. So, so proteins are composed of uh, amino acids in a very specific sequence where the chemistry of those individual amino acids gives the protein its, its various functional domains and mm -hmm. function. So they were able to create just a, a few amino acids uh, from this, this crude experiment. But not all 20, just... A right, less than 10. Okay. And they were the most simple ones. They weren't the complex amino acids that have these super complex side chains. But there's some major problems with what they did, even the ones they, they were able to create spontaneously. So amino acids come in left-handed and right-handed versions. So if you look at my hands, they're basically, it's the same structure, but one's a mirror image of the other. Right. And so molecules can be formed in, in that same way, but your body only uses left-handed amino acids. Okay. And so these conditions that they, they used in the 1950s created what's called a racemic mixture. So in other words, it was a combination of both left-handed and right-handed amino acids. Okay, well, that's different. Yeah, what good is that? You know, <laughs> your body needs left-handed ones, right? And, and on top of that, of course, proteins were not formed which you need complex cellular machinery to form proteins. And actually, later experiments were done uh, to try and create proteins from amino acids using, using various conditions. And of course, you have to remember, all these experiments are highly engineered. Mm -hmm. they, they involved very complex engineered laboratory devices and apparatus and so it's hardly what you would think of as a, a pond right. on a primal earth being zapped with lightning. So, but anyways, they actually tried to, to get some of these amino acids, these crude amino acids that were formed, uh, to, to, to bind together and make something that looked like a protein. Well, they actually, is all they were able to do is create these crude globs and sometimes circular ring structures, but nothing even yes. remotely looking like a real protein in a living system. And so these, these experiments were done early on, but then later in the 1960s, you know, the mechanism uh, of how RNA was copied from DNA 
and that RNA was used to create a protein at the, at the ribosomal machinery outside the nucleus. All of that began to come into play. And that complexity really threw a lot of gears in the evolutionary <laughs> theory about how life could have developed spontaneously. And scientists quickly became aware of the fact, hey, it's not just about proteins. It's about DNA, and it's about RNA. And in fact, to create DNA or RNA spontaneously like they did with, with some really crude amino acids, it just doesn't work. The molecules are too uh, sensitive. They, they just, you just can't do it. Wow. So the best they could do was, was to create a few crude amino acids under very engineered mm -hmm. <laughs> conditions that actually didn't even work. Wow. I didn't know that, but um, that's interesting that they, as they continue, they see, you know, we, we barely got enough of what we needed and just realizing it takes a lot more components, even with all that effort and trying to see what they can come up with. It, it really fell short in a, both times or both different scenarios that you've brought up. It fell short of really causing something that we could say, yeah, that looks like life is about to form there. So thank you for explaining that. And um, are there other problems with the concept of abiogenesis that we can clearly see or that is important to bring to our attention? Hey, there are problems when you look at these things. Yeah, there are. There's more problems. So when I was getting my PhD in the early uh, 1990s at uh, Clemson University, this idea of an RNA world was being tossed around. So in other words, scientists were beginning to say, okay, it wasn't proteins that were the first biomolecules that popped into existence. It was RNA. Well, RNA is very unstable outside of the cell. It, it decomposes incredibly rapidly. But the reason they said this was because some RNAs uh, had catalytic activity. In other words, they could, they could do very crude catalytic type reactions. Now they couldn't repl replicate themselves mm -hmm. <laughs> like a cellular system requires because any molecule like DNA um, that would pop into existence magically would also not only have to have been created in some mysterious way uh, itself, it would also have to replicate itself. And you just can't do that outside of a cell. Mm. And so really also this RNA world, you know, idea or hypothesis um, it falls way short too. So at present, I can't think of any uh, good research that, that solves this whole problem. Because you need DNA, you need RNA, and you need proteins all at once mm -hmm. together actually within a cell for life. And so you need more than just DNA, RNA, and proteins. Mm -hmm. You also need, you know, a, a cell. You need a membrane to enclose everything. You need uh, the proper pH. You need to control everything, you know, within this system so that you mm -hmm. can have something that's alive. And also, one of the big problems that has plagued this whole abiogenesis area uh, is this idea of the cell. So everything is enclosed within your cell and is very protected from oxygen because the environment we live in is called oxidizing. Mm -hmm. So it, it decomposes uh, everything. Mm -hmm. That's why metal rusts and right. that's why things deteriorate because we live in a oxidizing environment. It's a paradox because we need oxygen to live. <laughs> yes. But it's also very hard on the constituents inside cells. And so evolutionists first claimed that, that the earth was originally a reducing environment where there was a lack of oxygen. So they could say all of these uh, biomolecules that we need for life popped into existence and they were able to do so because there was no oxygen. Okay in the air. That makes sense why they would say Well, that. even secular geologists who, who accept an evolutionary history of the earth know that the chemistry of the rocks that we see all over the earth indicate that our environment that we live in has always been oxidizing. Mm. And so that's another huge hurdle yeah. that totally debunks the abiogenesis 
paradigm as well. So everything really is working against it. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's great for you to explain how all that is coming together and, um, thinking about those biomolecules, they, they really need a cell even just to survive. And, um, with the oxidized world that we live in. So all of these things are really, you know, it's, it's making me, not that I believed in this theory in the first place, but if I'm going to put it on the table and really look at it and discuss it, the validity of this argument. Um, it's, it's kind of coming up short here. So that's very interesting, um, that you would point that out. But with this being a theory that some believe or an understanding of how this could be the explanation, um, do all scientists, maybe broadly speaking, we can't really speak for everyone, but just broadly speaking, do scientists agree that this, that there's one way that this all occurred? Is there confusion across different scientists? Well, scientists, generally speaking, and, and I know how they think because I've worked at three different major research universities. I was a faculty member uh, at Clemson University for a long time. And I can just tell you for a fact that scientists are compartmentalized. In other words, they study their little pathway or their little enzyme or their little uh, isolated biological system. And they don't really think outside that box. They think all the other evolutionists have solved all the problems. And they just go along their merry way. So I've got kind of a funny little story because I asked uh, my postdoctoral advisor once. We were on an airplane coming back from some scientific meetings. And we got into the, the origin of life issue. And he basically Fine. said, I don't want to talk about it. Oh, wow. <laughs> And so this was a well, a well-known, well-respected uh, genomics researcher in the field, and yeah, that's just basically the the mentality is, I don't want to go there. Wow. Because okay. it's really that much of an obstacle. Wow. Yeah, that that speaks volumes. If you're going to hold to something, but I'm not going to talk about the details because there's too much confusion. So we're just gonna just keep going right past that. Wow. Um, another question I have for you is just looking at all of this, we've talked about the different scientists, um, you know, understanding this and, and maybe teaching this or holding to this. Um, for Christians, what would you say to a Christian who, for maybe a long time, short time, have agreed with this being the way that life came about? Or, you know, there's some of us just take a scientist's word as it is with no, no questions asked. So what would you say to a Christian who believes that this is the way life originated? Well, I would use the idea that, hey, when you build a system, whether it's a computer, a washing machine, an automobile, everything has to be put together all at once for it to work. Mm -hmm. The same way with the cell. And it's worse than just needing RNA, DNA, and protein. You need lipids, you need carbohydrates, you need various metal ions. The cell requires a lot of components. They all have to be put together all at once for it to work. In fact, there was a very, um, I would say, overly positive uh, abiogenesis researcher who thought he could put the requirements for a basic cell into a beaker so he had lipids in there that would form a membrane. He had DNA, protein, and so on. And he dumped them into a mud puddle. I, I kid Classic. you not. And this, mm -hmm. this, <laughs> this was a well-respected scientist, and he actually was surprised that a cell didn't pop out. Wow. I don't think he should have been. But yeah. anyways, everything has to be put together all at once mm -hmm. for it to work. It just can't yeah. happen bit by bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with that. And um, from what this sounds like, as people who believe in creation, I can speak for the two of us, um, looking at it's this explanation is vastly different than what we see or read in the Bible, that life didn't just come together by bumping molecules in a mud puddle. Um, but we believe that the Creator put everything together, and he would have had all of the components necessary right. to create life. Um, so 
I, that's what I would have to say to that. Do you have any other um, ideas or things you wanted to share to encourage our audience as they continue to face these different ideas from secular science? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great point. The Creator put everything together all at once in the beginning. And mm -hmm. why was the creation done in a, in a week's period of time? Well, you think about it, when an automobile or, or in a computer or something is assembled on an assembly line, it happens in a very short period of time. And so the creation week basically was a short period of time where everything was assembled um, logically and bit by bit and put together all at once, including all the different organisms and the cells within them all put together all at once for them to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now we have life, and it just continues to go. And um, I love that you've just really explained that for us, that we just see life and maybe don't ask these questions, but it really comes down to the Lord Jesus Christ creating these things, right. designing it. As you mentioned, the different things that we're used to seeing and using in our homes, there was a designer behind it, and uh, that's the reason why it continues to function the way it's supposed to function. Exactly. So thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you. It's been good. Well, to all of our listeners and viewers, we want to thank you for joining us for another episode. Of course, you can find this podcast on YouTube or wherever you find your podcasts. And subscribe so that you can know about any other episodes that we release. And if you have questions, follow-up questions about things that we've discussed, feel free to leave those in the comments. But my name is Ivana, and we'll see you guys next time on The Creation Podcast.